Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, colleagues and students. My name is Suzanne Stoter and I'm Professor of Sociology of Law and Dean of Erasmus School of Law. On behalf of the Board of Erasmus School of Law and the Erasmus Center of Economic and Financial Governance, I bid you a warm welcome today at the Pete Sanders Lecture, le lecture here in Rotterdam. I specifically like to welcome the guests who are joining us today through the live stream. A special word of welcome for our guest speaker and honorary doctor of Erasmus School of Law, Professor Katharina Pistor. And of course, to our panel members, Professor Mary Pietersen Bloom and Professor Martin de Jong. We are looking for a very interesting hybrid afternoon this, me this me afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pete Sanders Lecture Series is named after the late Professor Pete Sanders, who stood at the cradle of our law school. As Professor of Private Law and, among and many other achievements, as the spiritual father of the European Limited Company Act, he laid the foundations on which today's research profile of Erasmus School of Law is built where law, economics, and business meet. Pete Sanders was a very pragmatic lawyer with a special love for modern avant-garde art. As he himself said, the artist's creative ability has always intrigued him. By analogy, he was looking for new ideas and forms in law. Pete Sanders wanted to improve existing law and make the legal reality more responsive to changing societal and economic developments. His urge to innovate was also expressed in the art collection that he and his wife Ida accumulated. It is no coincidence that today's Sanders building, the home of our law faculty, radiates an aura of art and design. It's not difficult to make a link between Professor Pete Sanders and the speaker of today. On this occasion, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to pay tribute to the honorary doctorate which Erasmus University Rotterdam awarded last year to Professor Katharina Pistor in recognition of her pioneering multidisciplinary research on the relationship on and interaction between finance, financial markets and law. Due to the pandemic restrictions in 2020, it was not possible to celebrate this in an appropriate or, as we like to refer to, the customary manner. We will make up for this and, I feel tempted to add, why we will still can. Ladies and gentlemen, first I'd like to give the floor to Fabian Amtenbrink, Professor of European, European Union Law and together with Professor Helene Fletter van Dort, honorary promoter of Professor Pistor. Fabian, the floor is yours. Dear esteemed guests, if any of you would have told me five years ago that at the end of the year 2021, world leaders would still be discussing how to take effective action towards achieving the goals of the 1994 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and on the 2015 Paris Agreement, even I, and some of you know that I'm not known for being over-optimistic, would have called you a cynic. Yet. This is exactly what is happening. We meet here this afternoon, while we meet, the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference takes place in Glasgow with the declared aim to accelerate action towards the goal to secure global net zero by mid-century and keep 1.5% degrees within reach. Climate change and the devastating environmental, economic and social consequences it entails is one of, if not the, biggest challenge we face today. To be sure, greening, that is the process of becoming more aware and active about protecting the environment, 
does not only come with vast technological, but equally significant social, economic and regulatory challenges. Still, for many of us, and even more so for our children, it is impossible not to sense the urgency of the need for forceful and confident action to turn the tide. And it dawns upon many of us that, yes, there is such a thing as being too late. For many decades, we have by and large discounted and downplayed the medium to long-term effects of our unrestricted use of fossil fuels, large-scale deforestation and intense agriculture. We have put addressing the tough systemic issues that come with greening into cold storage, so to say. Namely, the question whether our well-established economic, social and governance systems, in their current form, are even capable of accommodating the action required to effectively address this most existential challenge of our time. Now, it is true that greening is on almost everyone's lips these days, including policymakers, also university policymakers, regulators, central bankers, the food and manufacturing industry, the, even the oil and gas industry, to mention only a few. Yet, we also still seem to be in the process of mapping the real implications of taking greening seriously. And already, despite this, a phrase had to be invented for those that exploit the term for their own malicious practices, greenwashing. Never underestimate the innovative and adaptive capacity of markets, you could say. Greening has all the characteristics of a wicked problem. And we academics, we love wicked problems. It is wicked not only because it involves many stakeholders with at least partially conflicting values and interests, and not only because it touches upon various policy domains, but because of the far-reaching systemic effects that problem solutions are bound to entail. So quick fixes and fiddling at margins are out of the question as far as I'm concerned. In fact, addressing the challenge head-on calls for profound reflections on the very foundations of our economic, legal and social systems and mainly also on the values on which they are based. Now, for some commentators, such as Professor Mariana Mazzucato of the University College London, addressing the major wicked problems of our time, and, and climate change is only one of those, calls for nothing less than the rethinking of capitalism itself. And in her opinion, and I quote here, changing capitalism means changing both how government is structured and how business is run, and how public and private organizations interrelate. End of the quote. In her book, Mission Economy, a Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism, she calls for a mission-oriented approach in which purpose and outcome should be, the, should be the main driver of public and corporate governance and of the collaboration between the public and private sector. So do we then need what Professor Masukato, in alluding to the 1960s Apollo spaceflight program, refers to as moonshot thinking to effectively address climate change and to truly implement a greening agenda? And even if the mission goal, mission statement, may be more or less clear and accepted in large parts of our societies, what are then the concrete implications of this for the way in which today's globalized markets and our interconnected economies are organized? And what role for private and public actors in achieving the mission goal? And of course, what role for law in all of this? Is law part of the problem in that it fortifies the current economic regime that stands in the way of greening? Or, to paraphrase the title of a well-known book by our guest of honor and keynote speaker, is law the code of capitalism? 
And can law maybe also facilitate a value and purpose-driven process of greening and mediate between conflicting values and interests? And what are then the implications for how future legal regimes have to be designed? Dear esteemed guests in the hall here and online, there is much to talk about. And we are honored and indeed blessed to have Professor Katharina Pistor with us today to make, as they say, sense of it all. Professor Pistor is Edwin B. Park, a professor of comparative law, and director of the Center on Global Legal Transformation, and of course, most importantly, since 2020, honorary doctorate of the Erasmus University Rotterdam. And previously, she held research positions at Harvard Law School, the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government, the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Law in Hamburg. She has published extensively in leading academic journals on corporate governance, money and finance, property rights, to mention only a few fields. And as my colleague Professor Helene Fletter van Dort and I have stressed in our laudation last year, what distinguishes Professor Pissor's research is how she builds with seemingly great ease, at least that's what it seems to from the outside, um, bridges between the legal discipline, her home base, and other science disciplines whereby law does not play the role of a purely auxiliary discipline. Instead, and in fact, law is perceived as one, if not the organizational principle governing our economic systems. And the work of Professor Pistor is also of high policy relevance. Uh, this is so because her research is mostly directly related to real-world problems or social challenges, as we say in uh, academic jargon. And an excellent example for this is her hugely successful 2090 monograph, The Code of Capital, that I alluded to earlier, which has the very telling subtitle, How the Law Creates Wealth and inequality, and inequality. So for those that know her critical work, it hardly comes as a surprise that our guest of honor has also critically reflected on the phenomenon of greening. So in a recent contribution for the online platform Syndicate Project, entitled The Myth of Green Capitalism, she does not mince her words when she observes about the private sector's embracing of greening that, and I quote, it is an approach that allows the owners of capital yet another way to avoid a real reckoning. So without further ado, dear guests, uh, I invite Professor Pistor to present her keynote, which she has given the thought-provoking title, Greening the Economy, Gimmick or Game Changer, or The Green Case for Transforming Capitalism. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, Katarina, the floor is yours. Just make sure. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, um, both in the hall. It's great to be in person here, but also hello to everybody who is online. Um, I first want to thank Erasmus University to the great honor that you bestowed on me last year, the honorary doctorate. We did everything online, and my husband had to play the <laughs> ceremony master and bestow me with the, 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 the cape and, and everything. It was interesting, but it's not the real thing. So it's wonderful to be here and just also express my deep gratitude. Um, also, thank you, of course, for being having the honor to give the first of this lecture series um, in honor of Professor Sanders. I appreciate this very much. So the title of my talk, as you can see, is Greening the Economy, Gimmick or Game Changer. Um, let me just first explain to you what I mean by greening. Um, I would think that greening has to accomplish several things. First, it has to realize respect 
and preserve the natural boundaries of our planet Earth. There is only one, and nature is bounded. Social systems seem to expand forever, but nature is bounded, and that's precisely the conflict that we're facing. Second, we want to ensure that all humans can live a life they have reason to value now and in the future, future generations as well. This is, of course, um, how Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum have defined capabilities. It's not about the survival of humanity, of a fraction of humanity. If we want to be true to our values, then we want to make sure that all humans can survive, and not only survive at a bare minimum, but have lives they have reasons to value. And last but not least, um, we have to protect non-human species and plants. And that's not just a question of just generosity, that's a question of self-preservation as well. What is greening the economy? I think what we're talking about when we look at the newspaper articles, journals, the things that consultancies, law firms and others are publishing or policymakers, we're talking mostly about market-driven transitions from brown to the green economy. We need to have the right incentives. We need subsidies to make this possible. We need assets, most of all, that are legible, liquid, and profitable. And we have to make sure that private actors are immune from liability, because otherwise they would not do this. Here, in the words of a private consultant um, who said in a publication that Clifford Chance put together for the Glasgow conference, we need to be able to count, visualize, and explain nature-based solutions in financial terms. Monetizing and being able to present the capabilities of natural systems in a way that financiers, accountants, and e-commerce specialists can understand and integrate into their normal planning and systems is crucial. So it's business as usual. We're just having to fold green assets into this system. This is how capitalism has always worked. So gimmicks abound, not surprisingly, because gimmicks have always been abound. Um, carbon offsets, one of the major strategies, market-based strategies, I think many are realizing that these are more licenses to pollute than actually um, curbs on pollution. ESG labels. The alignment with the taxonomies of ESG is not the same as aligning with the Paris goals. Debt nature swaps. Are they truly for greening or are we bailing out private creditors to ensure that they get some money from multilateral organizations and governments before the countries that they have lent to are unable to pay them. And last but not least, financing the transition. Banks and hedge funds are pretty explicit about the fact that they are investing in brown assets to fund the green transition, because these assets are still the most valuable. Here are just some data on the greenwashing um, that we are observing. Um, we have, as of 2020, we had about $35 trillion worth of so-called sustainable assets. Of 593 ASG funds, about 421 or 71% worth 265 billion in assets had negative Paris alignments. That means not only did they not meet the Paris goals, but they ran in the opposite direction. So do 55% of the 130 so-called climate funds. Assets worth $2 trillion were wiped out when the EU Sustainable Financial Directive went into effect because the disclosure that had to be done now clarified that these issues, these assets weren't really sustainable. And bank and asset managers have extended over $119 billion of financing to agribusinesses linked to deforestation between 2016 and 2020 alone, and the list continues. 
The latest from the conference in Glasgow, COP26, is of course one of them is GIFANS. I always say when acronyms are too contorted, you know that something is wrong here. The Glasgow Alliance for Net Zero, we have 450 banks, 45 asset managers signing on to them. They just announced that they have mobilized $130 trillion to fund the green transition, or to be actually more um, more clearly to be net zero by 2050. First of all, that's late. We should think about 2030. Second of all, people are already pointing out that they're engaging in a lot of double counting because some of the managers as, as, manage assets of other funds. So if you all count them in, then you're double counting. Plus, um, when you take the total assets under management of these funds and banks, it's actually not clear whether the commitments they're making, that they will be um, actually net neutral by 2015, uh, are realized. These are all soft promises, commitments that are non not enforceable, um, and, and, and therefore we have to trust their word. There's a deforestation deal at the Glasgow conference, but there are lack of details, so we can't even talk about this really in a meaningful way. And the global methane deal um, lacks um, some important emitters as well. So we're having a lot of gloss, a lot of announcements. It's not clear that any of them are worth the paper that they're written, written on. Of course, we also have government gimmicks. Um, the IMF recently reported that governments collectively subsidize coal, oil, and gas at the tune of $11 million per minute. So you can count as we talk. Um, uh, we're having subsidies for biomass. So if you convert from oil into wood pellets, you get subsidies but there's no reason to believe that they don't emit CO2. Of course they do, everybody knows that, but we are burning down the trees by the effects of climate change faster than we can rebuild them. We're de-risking private investments in green by using public-private partnerships. I will talk more about this uh, later on. Risk absorption by the governments, guarantees by the governments, which they extend to the private sector in the hopes of winning it over for a green strategy. Central banks have for a long time um, allocated resources or um, used assets as collateral based on market neutrality principles, which means that they do what the market does. And if brown assets and oil is the most valuable and safe asset, so do central banks think and extend funding accordingly. They're now shifting a little bit, but there's also a danger in the shifting because they might also go along with the greenwashing that the financial markets are doing. We have massive regulatory failure. Many of the environmental standards that have been set have not been implemented. Instead, environmental agencies uh, are defunded rather than uh, funded, and uh, rules are not implemented. And of course, as we all know, no country is on track to meet the Paris Agreement goals. Not even their pledges add up to the goals that the governments had set for themselves. So in the words of a judge who wrote a dissent in a recent opinion at a district court in the United States, never before has the United States, and I think the same could be said for most other governments, never before has the United States confronted an existential threat that has not only gone unremedied, but is actively backed by the government. So the debate whether this is we should use markets or state is a debate that makes no, not much sense either. They are imbricated. The Nets, I say more about this in a little while, but in our contemporary capitalist system, law and markets are intertwined, and so are governments and private actors. So is this a bug or a feature? Now, from what I said already, I gave away the answer. It's not a bug, it's a feature. Capitalism's logic is profit maximization by constantly expanding by shifting risk and externalizing costs to others. So over the course of the history of capitalism, these are core features that you see time and again. This is not what the economic models tell us. They tell us private property is used to internalize cost, and that yet, of course, we wouldn't have the pollution that we had had they done that. So we are greening not just any economy. We're talking about the greening of capitalism. And let me just say a few words about how I understand 
and explain the capitalist system so you understand where I'm coming from. Law, I argue in my recent book, The Code of Capital, is the cloth from which capital is cut. We're using institutions of private law and the principle of private autonomy to create claims and interests that are legally protected, but of course by those who know how to use the legal system. We grant access to the consolidated means of coercion, that's the shorthand for a modern state, but we grant access in a highly decentralized way so that private actors can avail themselves of coercion for the interest that they have just created in law. And of course, the public always stands by to de-risk or bail out if things go wrong. So in my book, I explain that when we talk about capitalism, we have to explain how capital is created. And I'm basically saying, give me any object, any promise, or any idea, and with the right legal modules, these are institutions of private law, I can bestow them with a set of attributes that gives their holders a comparative advantage over everybody else. Right? So you take assets, you take the legal modules, you put this together, you get attributes, and the end result is capital. The legal modules here behind me um, that I have been used most extensively for the last, say, 400 years, you can use others, but those that are most common are standard institutions of private law. It's property law, it's collateral law, it's the common law trust, it's corporate law, artificial legal persons, it's bankruptcy law, and it's contract law. The attributes they bestow on assets and by implication asset holders is priority. Law ranks claims. You have a stronger right if you have property. You have a better enforcement capability if you have a secured interest than having an unsecured interest if multiple parties are trying to enforce against the same asset or the same owner and debtor. Durability means that we are trying to protect assets over time and we're doing this by building legal walls, not brick walls, but legal walls around assets um, in the form of corporate veils and trusts. We separate assets so that not too many creditors have access to the same pool and thereby allowing that pool to incubate and grow over time. For financial assets, we also have convertibility, which is not just tradability or assignability, but it's the option to convert an asset into a safer one when things get rough, and pref preferably people want to convert an asset into cash, because cash is an asset that doesn't lose its nominal value even in times of crisis. So in the end, access to central banks is key. And last but not least, what the legal system does, contract law, property law, is not just an arrangement, a private arrangement, it's backed by the coercive powers of the state. And universality means is that the interests we have created in law will be protected against the world. The lawyers amongst you, of course, know that this is the standard formula for property rights. It extends, of course, to collateral, and we have extended it to, let's say, corporations as well, because with the incorporation theory, you can create a corporation almost anywhere in the world and get it respected and the rights enforced everywhere else. So in, universality is uh, critical within legal systems, but it becomes quite important also for our global system. So when we then add greening, we just add another loop in the transformation of simple ideas, objects, and promises by basically attaching, attaching green labels. So we have taxonomy alignment, we have offset criteria, we have credit support conditions, and in addition to the attributes I just mentioned, we're also getting immunity for the asset holders. Immunity from regulation, because after all, we do everything we need to do to green the economy um, with market mechanisms and private law, so we don't need regulation. And on top of that, ideally, immunity from any kind of liability as well. So liability is really, I think, the key word here um, that we have to think about more. And I just returned to an article that Lopuki wrote in 1996, quite some time ago, which is called The Death of Liability. And he likens liability to a poker game. 
The chips thrown in the pot are liability-generating economic activities. So in principle, any activity you undertake might create liabilities. It's clear in a contract. If I enter into a contractual relation, I promise something in return for something else. We have mutually meeting liabilities. But if I use my property rights and I harm others by just using my assets, I'm liable, in principle, for what I do. That's sort of the idea of liability. So economic activities in the good old days or in an ideal system, in a system that we may not want to call a capitalist, generate liabilities. And yet, Lupuki suggests that over the several decades, even preceding 1996, New record-keeping techniques and technology, but also new legal techniques, allow players to play and to win while withholding chips. So you're winning and making money without investing and without incurring liabilities. And he concludes that soon no, soon no one will have significant chips in the pot. When that happens, the fundamental nature of the game will change and liability will die. I think if you take a closer look at our shadow banking system, at the role that central banks play today, you will see that liability, in fact, has almost died. Some are still liable, but not everybody is. So how do we kill liability in private law? Let me just say again, a liability regime is really the way in which we govern, especially private relations. Tort claims, contractual relations, property rights that we use not only to deny or prevent somebody from taking certain actions, but to compensate instead. Employment law, tax, and environmental regulations, they're all basically monetary claims that you have to pay. So how do we limit liability in private law? We have concepts such as the privity of contracts. You have a claim against me only if you really have a contract with me. No third parties have a contract against either of us, even if we impose cost on others. Property rights are largely defined as absolute rights. There are, of course, exceptions, but the default is it's an absolute right. I can do whatever I want with my property, and if I impose harms on others, inflict harms on others, they have to sue me. That's their costs. Limited liability is a core feature of the corporate form. Has not always been, right? In California, until 1932, there was no limited liability. There was pro rata liability for shareholders, but has become a standardized form. Not only that, you can create a corporation that creates another corporation, creates another corporation, creates another corporation, each one of them shielded by the principle of limit, uh, limited liability so that you can park the most risky assets in one subsidiary and just spin it off in, in case its claims are too high, it goes bankrupt, so what? We'll just shift our activities elsewhere. And of course, we have these asset shielding devices. I mentioned the corporate form already, and the trust is just another one. That's just the private law. So if we just go a step further, um, we can also see how we protect these private interests against the state and against state regulation or intervention. We do this, of course, through constitutional guarantees, the guarantee for private property, but we also have to be mindful that what property is has changed over time. It used to be a use right to land or another tangible op object. It has become actually expected value. And that's since the late 19th century, we have recognized that an ongoing concern like a business is entitled to get compensation for expropriation in case the government intervenes with its operations. And in many other extent, uh, examples, you can see that what property is has been adapted to uh, the changing economy. So we have constitutional protections that protect private parties that do what I just described against interventions by the state. On top of that, we have created, of course, a very powerful international regime, a bilateral regime mostly, but also some multilateral examples to protect private investors that do business in a foreign host country against any infringements of their investment by that host countries, and that includes regulatory taking or any interventions with their investments, which basically means that the foreign party, the private party, can sue the host state outside the host state's territory in a private um, arbitral tribunal 
and yet enforce against the state, at least against assets out, outside that state. It is basically a mechanism to protect the status quo at the time when the investment was made against any future regulatory undertakings, and the international regime also immunizes these claims from constitutional principles because a bilateral investment treaty is, is, uh, does not take into account the constitutional provisions of the country in question. On top of that, we have provisions like unfair and inequitable treatment can also trigger compensation claims and whatever doesn't fit under, under an expropriation claim is very often um, uh, captured by this rather loose uh, provision, which is enforced by arbiters. Most of them come from private commercial arbitration and don't have much public, um, public law background. States can be held liable under this regime, but private parties cannot. So it's a very one-sided regime as well. And last but not least, we have what um, Daniela Gabor, who teaches at Bristol uh, University, an economist originally from Romania, has called the de-risking state in a paper called the Wall Street Consensus. So not the Washington Consensus, but the Wall Street Consensus. Showing, and of course we know this, everybody, anybody who has looked into the structure of financial um, instruments um, can see that, that we have created a system where government very often finance high-risk tranches of financial instruments. We saw that during the mortgage securitization where uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the government sponsors entities, uh, bought certain tranches in those and actually bailed them out when things went wrong. We have the creation of new asset classes, such as infrastructure, renewable energy markets, and carbon. We privatize to create new asset classes. We tax subsidize them. Here I just gave two examples from the United States. REITs, which are real estate um, uh, investment vehicles, and REMIX, which is a way to insulate trusts that hold securitized assets from taxes as well. We have government guarantees, and we have risk absorption in the form of offtakes supplies, currency inflation and termination risks that typically the government assumes. We have central banks intervening as the hedges and swappers of last resort, so they basically buy assets that nobody else wants to buy to prevent a crash of the market. And we have um, created lots of so-called public-private partnerships. And when you take a closer look at them, you can see that the risks are often borne by the public but the returns go the private, to the private parties. So we have structural features of capitalism that have evolved over time um, that are, I argue, incompatible with combating climate change. Now we are dealing mostly, when we look at Copenhagen, when we looked at Paris agreements, with soft commitments by firms, investors and governments, which provide gloss but don't touch the structures. I think even willing actors, corporate managers and directors, even some investors who realize that we have to change, face competitive pressures to avail themselves of the legal steroids available if their competitors do so, because otherwise you lose this in the system that we have. And lastly, I think without aligning liability and rewards, real change will ultimately remain elusive. So here I just want to um, talk about some basic principles for what I would call real greening, the real greening that I talked about in my first slide, thinking about the boundedness of the earth, thinking about humanity's futures and the ability to um, realize our own capabilities, and last but not least also to make sure that plants and, and other species can survive on this planet. So the first principle would simply be no direct and indirect subsidies for activities that cause environmental harm. It seems to be straightforward, but just realize we're not doing it. We're doing the contrary. There should not be a substitution of private with public liability. You're shifting liability to the public, and you can't align incentives to a greening strategy unless you leave the liabilities with private actors. There might have to be some sharing for the transition, but as a principle, we should go back to what economists have always told us, that private actors should internalize the cost of their actions. Otherwise, this is not a market economy, a private economy, but a socialized one. Um, 
And then to use Lopuki's parallel to the poker game, I think if you have no chips, we're not going to play a game, and you're not going to get any returns. Just as a principal matter, we need to have a comprehensive liability scheme for attributable harm, and of course this goes also into the area of civil procedure. Who has standing to impose liability? Who has to prove what? How do you prove causality? Issues that we, as lawyers, are very familiar with. We've seen this in product liability discussions. We're seeing this in supply chain debates today, and I think we have to think much harder about them in the context of climate change as well. If we continue to insulate the big players from the liabilities, not only of what they have produced in the past, but also what they will produce in the future, we will not see real change. I think it's just the logic of um, rational actor models um, so what are the more specific um, measures that I would advertise here? Um, abolish all subsidies for fossil fuels. 11 million per minute. We just have to get rid of that. Eliminate limited liability for climate harming investors. Expand organizational liability, again, product liability and some of the supply chain legislation that is coming out, such as in Germany, might be a first step in this direction. We have to facilitate enforcement by adjusting our um, procedural norms, who can enforce what, at what cost, um, and again, how do we allocate uh, the burden of proof. We have to downgrade the safety of brown assets, um, and not just wait for the government to subsidize green assets, including green wash, green washed assets. And we have to redirect the helping hand to support the most vulnerable, because none of the market mechanisms that we're talking about do anything for those people who are at the frontier of the effects of climate change, whether they're in Bangladesh, or whether they're in Kenya, or whether anywhere, anywhere else in the world, even the poorest amongst us in the most developed parts of the world. So, as always, there's hope and there's despair, um, and there are some cases in between. Here I'm just uh, recounting a couple of uh, court cases that came down recently, where you can get a, a sense of how differently we could begin to structure the legal system to get to the points that I mentioned. So I quoted the dissenting Judge Staten earlier from the ninth circuit court in the United States. The Juliana case was a case against the government. It was against the government basically saying, the government is destroying this country and we want the government to do something. The majority decision in this case said, the judiciary can't do anything about that. You have to go through the political process. Knowing, as the dissenting opinion suggested, that the political system is stalled and it will not happen. The judiciary threw up its hands and said, we can't do this. Then we had, in January of this year, the much more promising case of Ogur et al. against Royal Dutch Shell, and I'm sure you're also all familiar with that one, where the appeals court in The Hague ruled that the parent company, Shell, in the Netherlands had responsibility for a subsidiary in Nigeria for all that has been spilled. So it was a complicated case and has not been fully resolved. Um, rewards have not been, or remedies have not been awarded. But the question was that if there was a spill by a subsidiary legally separate from the parent, does the parent have an obligation? And the court says it has. There is an problem in the way the argument ran, however, because it said because Shell is making so much propaganda about how it's protecting the environment, it also has to make sure that the entire Shell family protects the environment. You could see how this could also be counterproductive because companies might stop making these kind of claims to avoid liability. So there are, there are problems here, but you can again see how the legal system can be used either way quite interestingly. Just one point here, a guru filed the claim in Dutch courts in 2007, I believe. It's taken 14 years to get to a preliminary decision. Just keep this in mind, we have 10, nine years to 2030. Um, the German Constitutional Court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, also issued an interesting ruling last year, which was similar to the Juliana case in the sense that 
um, plaintiffs brought a case against the government, not a private party, and claiming that a new law that was supposedly protecting the environment did not meet its goals. And the Constitutional Court said that's right. This is not enough, and people are protected under human dignity, um, personal uh, freedom, and obligations that the government has. It has to do something that is meaningful also for future generations. So this is an, a positive inkling. But then on the negative side, of course, we have a new filing by a German corporation against the Dutch government under the Energy Charter Treaty, um, LVE, trying to stop the Netherlands from phasing out coal because it will infringe its investments. So we don't know the result yet, but we've seen previous cases that make it likely to believe that the arbiters will side with the German company and then either the governments have to cough up a lot of money for foreign investors to be able to change their future policies, um, or we won't change. That's basically the logic of these type of ar arrangements. So, is there a way forward? Um, you know, I, I'm in principle a positive person, so even if I sound sometimes a little cynical and negative, um, but I think we have to think hard about how to change the system. And I don't think, you know, like a revolution or a wholesale change from capitalism is doable within 10 years to also accomplish all the other changes. So we have to work within the system. I think we don't have a choice right now. But we have to look at what spots can be moved and how so that we can change faster than we currently are. So we have no more time for gimmicks. We lost at least a decade or two with greenwashing exercises. And they were quite predictable, I would say. Neither do we have time to fight cases or the issue case by case. We can't do it through the courts. It can't take 10 years per case. And even if you get a case like Germany, you strike down a law, then the legislature has to get its act together and enact another. We're not making enough progress. I think it's time to recognize at a very fundamental level that the capitalist system that we have created over centuries, reinforced by contemporary governments and legislatures, is fundamentally incompatible with greening. And I think unless we recognize this, we probably also won't find better solution. We need a new liability regime. We have to stop killing liability. We have to resuscitate liability. And I'm thinking here a little bit along the lines of my colleague Chuck Sable, who is about to publish a book uh, with Professor Victor. Um, it's coming out, I think, next year in Princeton, but I had a sneak preview, and they're developing this notion of strong default penalties. So you can incentivize actors to find collaborative problem-solving strategies under an umbrella of default penalties. So if you don't do this, you're dead in the water, or you have to pay fines, or we'll just close you down. But thinking that you could just gimmick it by changing some market incentives and allowing them to invest in green assets will not be enough. You have to create strong default penalties and then encourage actors, public and private, to enter into collaborative problem-solving strategies. And of course, we also need a clear forensic of all the assets that banks and asset managers hold. We need to know what's on their book, how much money they spend on brown assets, and invest in, uh, in, in, in basically worsening climate conditions rather than solving climate change. So with that, I want to thank you very much for listening, and I'm looking forward to my commentators. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Katarina, for this uh, this, this uh, wonderful uh, keynote. Much uh, food for for thought. And I would now like to uh, invite uh, the other two uh, panelists, uh, uh, Professor Marie Peters Bloom and uh, Professor Martin de Jong, to uh, to join us uh, here for for the panel discussion. Let me introduce them uh, to you while they join us here. Professor Peter Bloom has a background in economics, if I remember correctly, and she's endowed professor of financial markets at Erasmus School of Economics. <clears throat> but uh, maybe more importantly here this afternoon, uh, she's head of investment office at uh, Rabobank, and before she was uh, um, working for the Arben Ambro private uh, banking, and there was also involved with the Global Investment Committee 
uh, uh, if my information is correct. And Professor uh, Martin de Jong, he's a background in public administration, uh, Professor of Dynamics of Collusive Prosperity at Erasmus uh, School of Law and also at the uh, Rotterdam School of Management. And he's the scientific director of the Erasmus Initiative Dynamics of Inclusive Prosperity. It's one of the big Erasmus University research uh, initiatives, a flagship as we refer to it, um, which has been established by Erasmus School of Law, the Rotterdam School of Management, and the uh, Erasmus School of Philosophy. And he holds many more prestigious positions, Martin. It's, uh, it would take too long. Um, so, uh, because I'm really looking forward to, uh, to, to starting, kicking off this uh, uh, panel a discussion, and uh, we have uh, agreed up front that uh, bro both uh, Professor Peter Zablum and Professor de Jong um, uh, get the opportunity to uh, briefly reflect on, uh, on what uh, Professor Pistor has shared with us, uh, maybe also ask questions if they have them, and, um, and, and uh, uh, Professor Pistor, uh, to, if you feel the urge to respond to that or answer any questions that may come up, before we then uh, open the floor for the uh, questions from the audience uh, in the room, uh, but also online. So if I then uh, uh, maybe start with uh, Professor Peter Bloom, please. Thank you. Your ideas. Thank you. Um, Professor Pistor, thank you very much for your distinguished lecture. Um, I learned a lot, uh, which I will only reveal at the very end of my response. Um, because uh, as the um, Professor um, Fabian uh, <laughs> introduced me, uh, I'm an economist, so I will respond with um, my economist perspective and also uh, as somebody who is a practitioner of green finance. In fact, my response is a defense of green finance um, and how to use its power to get a green economy, but fast. Um, my flight into this will be a little bit of economic history. Apologies to those who have already been taught this in their classes, but I think here in front of a, a legal, mostly legal audience, I suspect this may be relevant. Uh, but I will end somehow um, in the field of finance. Okay. So, as an economist, um, Arthur Pigou developed in his book, The Economics of Welfare, Alfred Marshall's concept of externalities, being costs imposed or benefits conferred on others that are not taken into account by the person taking the action. He argued that the existence of externalities is sufficient justification for government intervention. So if someone is creating a negative externality, such as pollution, for instance, he's engaging in too much of the activity that generated the externality, and Pigou advocated a tax on such activities to discourage them. Pigou also advocated subsidies for activities that created positive externalities. And they've become known, and are very well known, by economists, but also by governments, as Piguvian taxes and subsidies. And they're subsequently taught to every economic student taking courses in welfare economics or public sector economics, as I did, around the 1990s. But Pigou's book was actually published in 1921. So economists have known for a long time about the existence of externalities and the main remedy, governments acting through a system of taxes and subsidies. The remedy has, I think, a very important feature. Markets for all goods and services should be left to their own devices, creating the equilibrium or market clearing balance between private agents, supply and demand, with as little interference of the government as possible. For Pigou and Marshall also belonged to the neoclassical school of economic thought. The externalities are therefore created as a side effect of economic activity, unavoidable, but dealt with after the fact, because the taxes levied serve not so much to avoid, but to clean up the pollution. Only if the government levies the taxes directly onto the polluter will this company perhaps think twice, 
next time about creating the pollution in the first place. But even then, does the, gov does the company have the option to pass it on to the end consumer, who may then have the option to consume less of the good, but not if it's an essential good, such as heating. And when all other companies in the sector are equally passing it on, so that the goods demand curve becomes rather price inelastic. Post-World War II reality is the dominance of this type of neoclassical economic thinking and the growing free reign of markets with private companies producing and selling goods or services with lots of negative externalities in an increasingly global market. Its main opposite of neoclassical economic thought, Keynesianism, was in fact not diagonally opposite to this thinking at all, for it left a central role to markets and economies in place, but argued in favor of taxes and subsidies as a tool to reduce financial inequality. If done properly, through fiscal policy levers pressed at the right time, it would also in aggregate lead to higher economic growth. Governments in the 1950s through to the 1990s, I would argue, are arguing more about this latter role of governments. So its use of financially or economic redistribution powers, rather than its first role, dealing with externalities to the environment. Too few Pigouvian taxes were truly leveled and pollution was rife. This failing can, indeed, be partially attributed to economists who failed to come forward with a mechanism where externalities are fully incorporated up front in the price of production and consumption. That would have already really shifted the game much earlier. Markets are at the heart of what you, Professor Pistor, call capitalism. It is, in my view, important to understand that the market, though, is a mechanical thing. It is very good, as in efficient, in distributing the produce of activity according to preferences. But being mechanical, it also does not have a soul, a moral conscious or an ethical compass. It needs to be given that by us, humans, by society, and via the only way it, it, in which it can register or to incorporate that, which is through financial incentives, if you want to steer to a different outcome. I believe fundamentally that therein lies the solution, and so do in fact the green economists and the green finance proponents to which I also belong. Fast forward from the 1990s to the present day, we find this thinking increasingly embedded in mainstream economics. You have also noted, because you discuss carbon taxes, which is one of such concrete policy proposal. The creation of a carbon market through the levying of carbon taxes still needs to be done by the government, though, in its role as both collective tax collector and subsidy grantor, but also in its role as regulator. The carbon market, if set up properly, and that's what we've been failing up until today, but I think that can be fixed, fixes two main problems of Pigouvian levies. It directly affects the producer of carbon gases and it stimulates the transition of production to more carbon neutral methods. But there is more coming out of the economic school of thought. Also the circular way, uh, the circular economic way of thinking and policy proposals that follow from that comes out of this movement. And I've just recently um, um, enjoying this book, which is on new economy way of thinking, which is followed from the 2008 global financial crisis, a whole group of economists stood up. The book is called Thrive, and it talks a lot about different ways and different value systems that should underpin our economies, such as an economy of well-being, an economy of transforming practice, an economy of life, eco-feminist economists, Buddhist economists, it's wonderful. You wouldn't even expect this to come out of uh, the economists' corners, but it's there. I suspect, for I haven't read the book, I've just received it, that this is mostly about values. What I'm looking for is how do we translate those values 
into the system of markets so that we steer to a different outcome. The same as what I argue with respect to markets can be applied to finance, because finance is in fact just another type of market. It's a distribution mechanism for private investments that respond to the price of investment, which are otherwise known as returns. Similar to any other market, it's mechanical, it has no soul, it has no morals or ethical compass. It can therefore not be said that finance is inherently good or bad. But if humans manipulate the price, i.e. the prospective returns, it can be made to use for good or bad. Humans or society can manipulate the outcome of where finance is directed. Your proposal to stop all subsidies to fossil fuel energy exploration falls into this category. So do proposals to subsidize the generation of renewable energy, to subsidize R&D, to find the holy grail of green hydrogen and greater battery storages, to ban diesel cars from public roads, to tax air travel, to levy a larger VAT on the sale of brown assets. I can name a hundred or more of those types of measures, but will not bore you with that. I guess you are catching my drift. The outcome, though, is important, the outcome, because business models will either be less or more profitable accordingly, returns will start to differ accordingly, and finance will be directed redirected accordingly into one great self-reinforcing mechanism. Investors and asset managers will not need any taxonomies if financial and sustainable returns are aligned. Credit ratings will also naturally adjust because the companies that do not green their business models are the ones left with stranded assets, such as oil fields and stranded inventories, such as diesel cars and these companies will be more default prone. If we look carefully, then we can see in many places that this is already happening, and there I'm much more optimistic perhaps than you are. Just look to see what the equity price of fossil energy companies has done relative to peers in recent years, and why a traditional automotive company like Volvo recently announced that it intends to phase out the production of cars driven off fossil fuels entirely by 2030. That's not because of their non-self-serving motives, motives that this is happening. It is entirely self-serving, as in economically self-serving. In the corporate finance field, this trend is called the shift away from equity stakeholdership to society, societal stakeholdership. In other words, companies move to a modus where they serve society and not just the equity holder because it works in their interest. It works best and will be very powerful if the interests of society and equity capitalists are aligned. And here I refer to an economist's article that I saw this morning about, the, you will like this, the uses and abuses of green finance. Um, and it talks about the COP summit. And indeed, it says that the COP summit is, alas, shaping up to be a disappointment, but it refers to the GFAN's um, promise uh, that the, its members, you know, which include asset owners, asset managers, banks, insurance, that hold about 130 trillion of assets, willing to cut their emissions from their lending and investing to zero by 2050. Is it a gimmick? Is it fake? Is it cynical? Or is it sincere? I believe it is a sincere, but I also um, agree with you that it's a soft commitment and that what I see around me in green finance, that there is definitely amongst the majority a willingness to do this and to direct finance towards green purposes. But we also have problems that we face, um, and the, the Economist is also referring to this, having to do with coverage having to do with data, having to do with measurement. And then, alas, there it is, the economist's perspective. The third problem is incentives. Private financial firms aim to maximize risk-adjusted profits for their clients and owners. Despite lots of wishful thinking, it's not well aligned with cutting carbon. There we are. 
Well, thank you very no, much. No, 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 no. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. But now it comes Could to the ask you to Yeah, I wrap it up. Wrap it up, please. So, where is the failing in this green economy and green finance is not yet working forcefully enough? The failing is, in my view, in the set of financial incentives that influence markets. For me, as an economist, the failing of government has long been clear. And if I stretch my imagination, perhaps the failing of governments as well. And if I look at what governments are doing, that they are driven by short election cycles, um, and that there is a lack of real ac um, accountability in our democratic system. But what you have shown to us today is that the failure is also knitted into our legal system. Our elected governments have created laws in many places that have contributed to the misalignment of these economic and societal or, or sustainable goals. I can now see that through these laws, they have also changed the game, but not in a particularly helpful way. And that what I had in scope was the green economy, but not the totality of the green capitalism, which very much includes the legal system. I consider this the greatest uh, contribution of your address today. And also the fact that much and much more needs to be done much faster, which I agree with. I hope that my reflection sways you to believe that our different fields, economics, politics, law, can and should join forces to use the power of green capitalism for good by changing the rules of capitalism and designing it to make it work for and no longer against the greater societal goals. Well, thank you very much and apologize for, for so no rudely worries. interrupting you. Uh, I had my rhythm was a different one than your as far as your own text was concerned. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much for, for kicking us off. And uh, luckily enough, you there are some things you agree upon, but I also sense there are some things where maybe you're not. And this is exactly, of course, what we're looking for here. Um, uh, Martin, Professor de Jong, may I ask you to, to, to continue? Yeah, Professor Thank Pister, you. so you, in, in my neighbor you may have to convince somebody who is more from the orthodox economic stream. Now, I may be addressing you from a different angle. Um, I actually had the pleasure of reading your book, so I could also see the presentation that you gave, a little bit in light of, of your book. And I see it as applying uh, at least partly the same concepts to a new territory, which is less the socio-economic dimension and more the ecological dimension, um, if you wish. And you see, r roughly speaking, the same things as I. That is, there is a lot of greenwashing. We already know for decades it's going wrong, it's not really happening, but the story is that we're doing it. So you could call it greenwashing, and actually, but we're postponing action. Maybe we're doing something, but it's not enough, or we are even moving in the wrong direction. And we see this in corporate social responsibility reports that now are um, you know, due to be removed and replaced by something else. We see it through ESG. We see it through, you now in the domain that I'm from, urban planning and geography, we see it in eco-cities. Um, and we see it in green technologies. Each time, hope is created and then dashed. And then we need, need a new international summit to create new hope for something new. And then probably it will not be happening again. Um, maybe other people will say that they're not cynics. I have become a cynic. Uh, I would never go to Glasgow. Now, what we can see is that the argument is of always about efficiency, but there is really power relationships behind it. And efficiency is a cover-up, because the rules of the game have not really changed. And maybe what it would require is a thorough overhaul of corporate law, a thorough overhaul of contract law, and actually the many more that you mentioned in your talk. Now, you have a radical perspective I would say I almost totally concur, and I think that the role of the law is really your major contribution to this field. I think few people had seen how important the law is the way you have. Um, we do, however, see a growing number of publications that also adopt this more critical stance. Uh, uh, we've, uh, um, 
Fabian Ontenbrinkt already mentioned Mariana Mazzucato. Uh, she is, of course, famous. Thomas P Piketty um, has made the headlines. We know Kate Rayworth. Um, a person who particularly impressed me was William Lazonic. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Uh, he is in between economics and business, and basically has the argument that shareholders are using the law to suck up all the resources from companies so that they can't in innovate anymore. Uh, made brought nearly tears to my eyes how he was describing it, but of course he is set apart as a lunatic, so I don't think he will really make it. Um, but, so these people are derided, but they are growing in numbers. Now, something you, maybe I would like you to clarify for me from your book. Often you say, well, the rational choice activists say this, but they are theoretically wrong. And the Marxists say this, but they're theoretically wrong. But if I read between the lines, then I could easily see that your story is merchants of doubt. They are creating false consciousness. The state is a toy in the hand of capitalists. Capital accumulation, it's really happening. So my question to you is, what makes you different from a Marxist? <laughs> um, I'm sure you have, I, I'm, we, we all know that communism is not the answer, but we all know that capitalism needs an overhaul. So the question is, what overhaul is it? That is the question. That's not an easy, because there is no immediate alternative. I think you and I will both be path-dependent theorists, so we know that we have to work with the tools that we have. Well, actually, we think the tools are wrong, but how do we get to other tools? Now, so kicking capitalism, is there an, an alternative? It, it's pro surely not communism. Then what is it? Um, my own preference would be to entrench the interests of sta other stakeholders representing the various production factors. You know, finance or capital, if you wish, is only one particular um, a production factor. It's one that we overvalue in current society. We also have land slash nature. We have human capital. We have social capital. Should they be somehow be more strongly entrenched in corporate law and contract law and in boards to make sure that they exert veto rights? And 20 years ago, I would have called this a green polar model, but now maybe I think these forces should be more strongly represented. And then finally, I see that a lot of people place hope in democracy. I do not share this hope. Why? Because in the past 30 years, government has been hollowed out by what a lot of people have called neoliberalism. I think neoliberalism maybe is not a very meaningful term, but it shows that basically government had to become more and more efficient, and people were more and more pushed by uh, performance indicators to do the same work for less or more work for less. Um, and it was measured in very particular indicators that didn't represent the holistic picture. Um, a lot of Talented people have left the government. They no longer want to work for the government. The government is weak. Um, and we also know that a very sh uh, large percentage of our people actually don't believe in government anymore, will not go to the vote anymore. And if they go to the vote, it's probably for the wrong party. And the existing dominant parties, they don't seem to be up to the job. So do you ever believe that through democracy we can solve this? Maybe the judges have to do it in the end. I'm so curious. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed. I think there's uh, in itself probably is enough food for thought uh, to have uh, Katarina uh, spend the next uh, half hour to, to <laughs> answer this. Uh, I will not encourage you to do qu quite that, but, uh, but, but I, I think it's appropriate to, to if you would like to, to, uh, to respond to uh, uh, and and I, I, I think that, that really this has worked wonderfully in the sense that different uh, perspectives uh, have been brought in by, by our two panelists. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for also taking the time to listen and to read my previous work and to really think about the issues at hand. It's, it's really important to have debates. I'm all for that and I'm, uh, I love also controversial debates. So, you know, I think in terms of the economics versus law, um, 
it's not an either or. I think it's the assumptions that we make and the ability to empirically verify these assumptions. I don't think we live in a Pugovian world. I don't think we can clearly separate the government and the economy. I also don't think that the legal institutions that are, have been created for our capitalist economy respond to changes in the way that one has to assume if you, if you think in, in, the, in, 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 in your terms. Let me just go back to limited liability, right? Will investors really restructure their portfolio if they are shielded from I any liability. So you will say price mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. But the price mechanism would be much faster and much more responsive if we eliminated limited liability for polluting companies. That's what I'm asking. I would love to have a world in which we could govern a lot of these things by markets and by exchange. I just think that the structures that we have and that are, in my view, fundamental for capitalism don't allow the translation of these incentives into real action because we have buffered the system against responsibility. Private actors are not responsible for their actions. And I think that's part of the problem they face. May now, I when, just very quickly yeah. respond to that? Sure. I think uh, the limited liability is an incentive. It's a negative incentive that is not incorporated into the investment decision. So you make risk taking asymmetric. It that's only right. has an upside. You can so say, yeah, exactly. And we did this at a certain point in time to encourage people to invest in corporations, but it's counterproductive today. Yeah. There we agree. Okay. So I think, but, but that's, so I think it's really important to look at the micro institutions, how they affect decision making, mm -hmm. and to think about markets not as you know, autonomous actors just looking at price mechanisms that are autonomous from or independent from these structures. They're imbued by these structures. And unless that is f figured in, I don't think we can make predictions about how people will behave. And when you look at what law firms do, when they um, advise clients how to deal also with new you know, financial regulation, environmental incentives, is to make sure that they can continue to maximize profits within the constraints that the government gives them. The legal change is that, you know, I think we can blame a lot on the government. I have no problem with this either. But I think um, most regulatory changes are quickly mooted by lawyers who know how to use the modules of the Code of Capital to get around responsibility. And that's why I think the model that you have in your mind does not work in practice, although I would want it to work because it would be nice. It would be so easy to fix the world. So to Martin then, sort of in a way, I'm not against markets. I just think that these markets are not working the way that we theorize about them. I think I'm a kind of a neo-Marxist in some terms. Um, I'm uh, maybe a little hesitant to embrace that notion because you know my first 10 years of my academic life was uh, uh, spent on studying the transition of the former socialist world into a different one. And I'm highly skeptical about the ways in which the socialist system had been structured. Um, but I'm equally skeptical about capitalism at this stage. So, Another reason why I didn't, in the book, embrace Marxism um, completely was because I think the, sometimes the focus is too narrow, especially amongst the neo-Marxists, on the expropriation of surplus from labor, and I just want to paint a broader picture. It's expropriation, if you want, or um, extraction of surplus, but not just from labor, from social resources. One of the important social resources is the law, another one is money, which brings me back to finance. Finance is not just like any market. Fin financial instruments are not widgets. Financial instruments are created in law. They don't exist outside the law. And they're always tied to money for which finance theory doesn't have an explanation. State money. It's state money that is the asset that we use as a last resort. It's the only truly liquid asset because only state money doesn't lose its nominal value even in times of crisis. It can lose its real value, but it doesn't lose its nominal value. Every private asset does. So I think we really have to think harder um, about um, the structures of our system. And, and you know, what I've devoted my, 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 my life to is sort of to think about the legal structures. Now, what to do? Can democracy save us? Uh, how do we save ourselves? Um, I'm also deeply frustrated with our democratic system. I think it um, doesn't serve uh, much of society. It's very difficult to fix it. I live in the United States. I'm very worried about the country. I think it's drifting towards authoritarianism. 
Um, I'm also not sure that even an ideal democracy will be fit for purposes when climate catastrophes are upon us. Um, the book that I always refer to when thinking about what would happen is the book by Jeffrey Park, um, The Great Crisis, the 17th century, when we had the Little Ice Age. And two th one third of humankind died prematurely in the 17th century. The only country that, and it was basically climate change because there were volcanoes in Indonesia that broke out and, and um, El Nino effects, and so the entire northern hemisphere was affected. Japan did fairly well with a very centralized system. <laughs> Most other countries um, um, suffer, um, have succumbed to revolutions, uprisings, uh, wars. 30-year war was in the 17th century for a reason. So um, I'm not sure that a democratic system which has been attuned to expecting growth, no matter what, is capable of dealing with climate change. So this would be a different talk and a different conversation, but I think that, of course, the two are linked. But neither capitalism nor the democratic system as we have them can deal with losses. And green transition is about losses, allocating losses, and we can't do this. Markets don't do this either well. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, do I understand that correctly that different uh, to uh, our other two panel panelists, you do see a role for the state? I'm trying sort of like to figure out whether you all agree that this, the, 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 the role of the state, well, which is something different than the role of law yeah, or a liability regime as part of a legal regime, do you see a role for, for the state in this? Some, some would argue very much so, and we need a moonshot uh, mission and a strong state that will you know, make the necessary investment boldly, make choices, or do you mainly look at, at legal mechanisms by which you get to grips or, or get control of, of, of what the markets do? So, you know, I've reached a point where I don't think about the states as an you know, like a personification of some actors, even if we don't think about a unitary state. I think the state is the ways in which we have institutionalized access to the coercive means of enforcement. And we can do this in a centralized fashion, we can do this in a decentralized fashion. And we can, we're doing both, right? We have some regulators that have certain enforcement powers, we have courts that can do this. We have also private actors that can avail themselves of these powers by structuring things that they know will be enforced and by ensuring that whatever they create will find the blessing of a regulator. But I think we have to, I think, go away from this simple dichotomy of state versus market. What is the role of the state? I think we have to reconfigure the way in which we use our consolidated means of coercion for what types of ends. And then we can talk about how to, but, but clearly, it, 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 everything we do that has um, effect rests with the ability of really mobilizing our consolidated means of coercion for a particular end. Um, but this can be done in different ways. Thank you very much. I think we're just about ready to, uh, to start uh, to, to, to engage with, with the audience uh, in the room, uh, in the lecture hall, but also uh, online. So hopefully with online, I'm going to get a little assistance in helping me with uh, questions. So I'm first, let me let me look around the room and uh, invite you to, to ask questions and uh, comment, but maybe not only comment, but also have questions. Professor Takema, so maybe uh, it's good if you uh, wait for the microphone, that's the first thing, because otherwise our online audience cannot hear you. And secondly, if you start by very briefly introducing yourself. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Pister, uh, my name is Sanna Takma, um, working here at Erasmus School of Law. Uh, and my question uh, actually concerns your ideas of, uh, well, the ways forward, basically. And I was struck, uh, for one, well, for one thing that I really liked is that you addressed this, that it's not just a negative picture of everything is wrong at the moment, but you're also looking for ways forward. Um, but I saw some tensions in things you say there, and uh, particularly, on the one hand, you say that it's time to recognize capitalism's incompatibility with greening. And then it seems to me that this, the other things you propose, talking about assets, new liability regimes, actually stay in the mold of capitalism. Uh, and I was wondering, um, how far does your sort of rethinking of these um, legal codes, such as property, such as liability, 
um, go um, and move you away from the capitalist system? Or are you staying within the strictures of that? Yeah. So it's building a little bit on Martin's comment, but maybe a bit more specific. Shall I collect a, a couple and then mm. gives you time to uh, uh, prepare yourself? Who else would like to? Please wait for the microphone. Thank you, Federica Violi, Erasmus School of Law. I have two brief questions. Well, one question and one is sort of, of a comment, and I would like to ask you for your reflection. Thank you very much for your lecture. The first one is, um, I mean, of course, this is also a story of production and consumption. Um, and I was thinking very bluntly, what do you think of degrowth theories? Um, and this was prompted to me by the fact that you mentioned uh, that social structures can expand um, infinitely, na nature cannot. Um, the second question is, since we're thinking about legal structures, um, a reflection that was inspired to me from the law of the sea realm, actually from a, um, a piece of Professor Ellen Hay, who is a professor here at the Erasmus School of Law. Um, we see in international economic law a profound disconnect between nature and humankind. So nature was always conceived as an asset, indeed, to exploit, to own, um, to sell. Um, and this has created a situation by which nature is always considered an exception. So international trade treaties or international investment treaties, they consider distortion of nature as a harm and as an externality to be corrected. So first of all, we regulate trade relationships and then we correct the externalities. Now in, in law of the sea, to a certain extent, through the uh, idea of the common heritage of mankind, we bring back distributive justice at the core of the discipline. So we think of benefit sharing, burden sharing, and um, a regulated administration of resources. Whereas if you think of it, for example, in terms of the freedom of high seas, which is what we mainly have, is again free access to resources only to be corrected later on. So I was thinking whether we could start from a concept similar to the common heritage of mankind to a, a complete overhaul. Thank you. Thank you. I suggest we have a first round of reflection, and uh, okay. I would invite, first of all, uh, Katarina, and then any thoughts that our other two panelists have. So thank you for both of these comments. So, so yes, um, I think I critique capitalism as fundamentally incompatible with greening, and I'm using mechanisms that are um, standard features of our legal system and resuscitate them. And the question is, can, can we really break out? And I think there are two issues here. I think first, the capitalist system that we have has, if you want, morphed certain legal institutions in a certain direction. As I said, we have killed liability. So one way to at least make some progress is to resuscitate liability. And that's sort of a market mechanism to align interests uh, with um, uh, to internalize costs and align interest with the cost that will be created. The other point is that, um, you know, I've, I've studied the former socialist transition for at least 10 years, and I'm not sure there was ever a transition, there's always been a transformation. These are really long-term complex processes. We don't have the time for that in the environmental rearm. I think we have to use the tools that we have now to their greatest effect, even if they make compromises, and, but we can't just get out of the system easily. Um, it's, it's a global system, it's deeply inter interdependent these days, and so my thinking is more like weakening the worst as aspects of it and strengthening others, even though um, this does not f um, amount to a wholesale transformation. On the positive note, I also think that well-placed strategic incrementalism, as I call it in my book, might actually result in a transformation in a much more powerful way than if you did a quick fix. We saw this in the transition context, right? Sort of radical reforms versus gradualism was the debate there. And, and, and I'm basically a gradualist, but it's strategic gradualist, if you want. Um, in terms of common heritage of mankind, um, yes, I mean, this is where we should be going. This is the kind of problem solving that we should be thinking about. So when I say greening is about capabilities, recognizing the biological constraints of planet Earth, um, et cetera, that, that's, that's, these are the concepts in the back of my mind. Um, and then again, sort of the questions, how do, you, how do you get there within the system that we currently have? But I think normatively speaking, this is the kind of problem solving that we should be doing. We shouldn't spend all of our time on yet another attempt to disclose and another attempt to create taxonomies and a better labeling and a better pricing mechanism. I think, and then 
pay all the rentiers along the way, the consultants, the accountants, the lawyers, to, to do all that, if you add that up and you could sort of create conditions under which we would do problem solving, multi-stakeholder problem solving, public and private actors, if you want to call them, I think we probably would make more progress than trying to mimic a market that doesn't exist, in my view. Yes, please. Yeah, I think um, you're putting uh, the, finger, the finger, I think, on another weak spot, uh, which is the fact that we've been using nature for a very long time as a free good of production. Um, and I was told uh, fairly recently that that goes back to the, uh, the Renaissance and 17th century sort of thinking where, you know, humans place themselves above nature. So it's, it's deeply embedded, I think, in our culture. But it's also find it, its ways, I think, in a very detrimental way in our economic system. So uh, what Professor Pistis just pointed out is clearly one way of trying to address that. I also very much believe that we have to work within the system. There isn't really an alternative. Uh, none of the alternatives have proven to work better. In fact, they've proven to work worse. Um, but also, the, the, the current system is the reality of life and we have a fairly short time. So we need to try and work from within the system and trying to fix that in, on all fronts. Um, how can we work, how can we uh, do things from an economical perspective in this respect? Um, it's called circular economic thinking. So whatever you extract from the economy, you have to place back. Um, so then the economy doesn't become a purely free good. And, you know, circular economy is about, it's about very much about that. But it's also about um, whatever, you, whatever you create can be reproduced in a different form um, for another purpose in, in future life, right? And I think that then comes the role of the state. I do, th I do believe in a big role of the, of the state. Um, the state can introduce um, regulations and laws to practically enforce this. Okay, Martin. Um, I also believe in the state, but as a public policy scholar, I've learned that the state doesn't exist um, because it consists of many different organizations that often work at cross purposes. Uh, and therefore, the general interest does not exist. That's what I was taught at school. Now, I've become a little bit more, well, not nuanced, but a little bit more, you know, holistic in the sense that I think maybe there is such a thing as a general interest. Um, but a, a mission economy, as proposed by Matsukato, is still complicated to realize just because the state is internally divided. Uh, and we cannot put it together again as if it was one. Um, also, I think it's too fractured now to really fulfill that job. Um, moreover, the examples that she gives in mission economy are from the past. It's a technological project done in the 50s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. And that's very different than a, so, a large socio-economic project, ecological project done in the 2020s. Those are two fundamentally different things. So I, think, I don't think the state is up to that job anymore. Um, we should somehow work with the state as it is, um, but really try to find those spots in changing capitalism where we can make a difference. Because we know that our parliaments have to enact a whole lot of laws and they don't have overview anymore. So what we should do, I think, is really focus on critical junctures, which are the things, which are the attractors in the system that really make a difference. And then I think that corporate and contract law really make a difference if all the different types of capital, uh, not only financial, financial is then only one of them, but also human, social and natural capital are really competing on equal ground. And that means not using monetary value to assess them because then one always wins. And then you have a term like inclusive wealth. And inclusive wealth is not the same as inclusive prosperity because eventually it's all coming in cash. And, I don't, and you cannot really calculate the value of land in cash anymore. So land or, or human capital have to be valued in a different way and yet on equal terms. Now, often a lot of emphasis is put on metrics. They help, 
but they are not really the answer because they are basically not enforceable. You will always find excuses not to do it. So I think we need legislation, presumably still democratically endorsed, that actually change various aspects of private law in such a way that those other types of capitals are really able to veto finance if finance is obviously going in unsustainable directions. But I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued, or shall I say uh, confused, because he, if I understood you correctly, uh, you said at some stage that uh, maybe general, there is no such thing as a general interest. What is climate change or protection uh, from climate change or greening? As what do you define that? Or, or uh, uh, re better redistribution of wealth? What is that then? It's not a general interest, it's a, it, it is what then in your world? In the end, it's only a word. It's only a word, uh, but it has come to mean a lot for us, and presumably there is such a thing. Uh, but when you work it out, a lot of stakeholders will interpret it in different ways. They will say, oh, this was already historically present. Oh, this is just the ending of the old ice age. This can be anything. So people will eventually interpret it in different ways. Now, I do think that climate change exists very strongly so. Uh, and I do think that you can uh, use the state as a useful legal artifact. In fact, you need it. Um, but we have to be aware that there is eventually always conflict between different individuals slash stakeholders slash parties uh, in society uh, and that uh, we have to face that. Thank you. We have uh, one, two, at least two more if we start with the gentleman in the back who I know but he will introduce himself. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, my name is Jurien Kampost, I'm from the Erasmus School of Economics and I want to thank you for a very interesting lecture um, and thought-provoking. Now, as an economist, I'm somewhat deformed. So the first thing I thought when you were starting your talk, I thought, okay, we know this, this is externalities and Professor Pizza Blume, um, Blume Pizza, I forgot, <laughs> she phrased that much better than I could. I think it was very worthwhile. But then I also noticed that somehow, like, I was really deformed because all I heard in a lecture was actually you arguing that incentives work. You just argue that the incentives are wrong. And then you said the markets don't work and the incentives don't work because there is a system of law, in contract law, uh, things how liabilities are being shielded and limited which create all the wrong incentives. So can you please deprogram me as an economist and tell me why markets are wrong, incentives don't work, instead of that, in a way, we let law be captured by lobbyists, by interest groups. Uh, in economics, we would call them rent seekers. So if you could please yeah, deprogram me, I would be very happy. Thank you again. Take one more. Thank you very much. Uh, would you please come to the front. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Elena Kantrovich Reznichenko from the Erasmus School of Law. Uh, I wanted to ask if you also have some thoughts on who should be the drivers of the changes, the legal changes, given that the status quo is, uh, there are a lot of invested interest in keeping the status quo, and the way it was formed, again, also it came from very strong interest. So who would you expect would actually practically going to drive and break the status quo, especially because you said, I'm not talking about revolution, but more a, a quick or incremental. So, yeah, okay. So, thank you for both questions. So, you know, I can't deny that there are incentives and people respond to certain incentives. I won't deny this either. Um, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with the concept of externalities. I think what is important to realize is that the fundamental institutions that have created our capitalist economies are not just 
reinforcing market type of incentives, but can be played in different ways and have been played in different ways. And it's not just that legislatures enact them. Just remember that the fundamental institutions of private law pre-exist modern nation states. They were all first capitalist and then became democratic. You can't just blame the state. These institutions precede the modern nation states, certainly precede the um, dem democracies. The corporation is modern nation states, maybe bankruptcy law, but contracts and property collateral law is not, and trust law is also from the, you can trace it to the 13th century. So we have to understand that we have multiple layers of legal systems and that the private institutions of law are malleable and have been formed by private actors in their own self-interest along their own incentives, but they're backed by the state. They're using a social resource to maximize their own self-interest, if necessary, against the broader social interest, if such a concept exists. That's a very different perspective than what economists very, much, very often assume. They think property rights are fixed. Once they have fixed, the markets will allocate them subject to certain rules that an umpire will enforce. In fact, property rights are malleable. They're changed and newly created all the time. The players in the game change the rules of the game as they play. And unless we build this into our models, I don't think we're capturing fully what's going on. There's still incentives, but the incentives are actually to get control over the rules of the game, not to allocate the widgets. That's, that's the core thing. The second question, um, is uh, who are the drivers of change? That's, a, of course, a fundamental question. So, and that goes back to a question you asked earlier. Shouldn't the judges ultimately do with the courts or the independent regulators or the central banks, right? Aren't they our saviors? Where else can save us? The democratic processes are very often broken, and the democratic processes typically don't reach the private law. That's hardened off, and we don't touch it. It's the holy cow that nobody wants to touch. So I'm hopeful when I see some cases, like the Shell case, where we actually use institutions that exist, piercing the corporate veil, allocating responsibility in different ways, and the question is how could we do this more broadly. So, as I mentioned in my talk, I think we have to think about who has standing to bring actions to reinforce what we have, but it will take too long. So we do need political mobilization, we need government action, we can't do this without. Um, I think, I'm thinking very much also how much we can do within countries that have a political system that is responsive and that might have spillover effects to others, that are leaders that sort of have a major impact on markets and actors. That's where we have to, you know, all of the above. I don't have a silver bullet. It's a, the, the point is that you have to have you, every mechanism that you have in your toolbox. Thank you very much. Any thoughts on this? Um, I still... Uh, I, I, have, I, I agree that, about the importance of incentives. I think uh, that's relatively indisputable. Um, what, what I may qualify as the working of incentives is that they are not based on money alone. At least this depends on actors. If you apply incentives, for instance, within organizations, well, we know, for instance, Anthony Downs, who um, made up public choice theory, he had rather sophisticated ways of looking at the incentives that workers in an organization or government bureaucrats have. That's not only money, it's also security, it's also job enjoyment. I think we should use the term incentives, but we should be really specific on what type of actor they are administered to. For shareholders, it may be purely money. But for workers, it can be a different thing. And for government bureaucrats, it can also be uh, a, a varied thing. So we should be sophisticated about how these incentives affect human behavior, I think. Thank you very much. I have uh, one gentleman here with a question. <laughs> Thank you. René Repasi, Erasmus School of Law. Um, thanks a lot for the lecture. And um, as many in the room, as we have heard from the questions, from the comments, I also had the pleasure to read the book and could basically combine our lecture uh, with the book. And I think something that must still be emphasized, okay, I'm a lawyer, hence I have a very lawyer's uh, perspective on this, but I believe the uh, huge added value that uh, your research gives to our discipline is that uh, we see how the mechanics of our discipline contribute to a bigger picture. 
And basically also, now it takes a little bit away the argument, there are bigger forces at stake that we cannot influence, that's how the world is, there is no alternative, let's go on, and let's continue, it's not our responsibility. So it brings us a certain kind of responsibility back to our discipline. And I think the, the response that you just uh, gave in the, in the previous round of questions, that private law institutions that we're looking at, they are older than democracies, they date back uh, uh, centuries, sometimes even before Christ was born to, 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 to Roman law. So it's something that might be actually deeper ingrained in how humans interact with each other than that we can influence it within a short time frame of 10 years. Hence, accepting how the mechanisms are and don't give them simple isms in order to put them into a bigger picture that we can then difficultly change. So I'm in a sense also a cynical, but not when it comes to democracy, state, or politicians, but when it comes to isms, because we hide behind them, showing them that we cannot change much. But I want to go now one step further, because we had now a discussion about the state, we had a discussion about regulators, a discussion about politicians, and in the first round of answers, you gave one sentence that is also quite prominent in your book, that there is the code of capital, but there are also the coders, and that there are the lawyers. And they are basically the ones, if we come with a regulatory innovation, uh, that come with making use of private law institutions that we all teach perfectly in law school in order to go around, because they are then hired by other interests and are actually following those interests and completely undermine the idea that any regulatory activity might have. And in that sense, my question goes into, now yeah, here we are talking legal research, legal theory, etc., but we're also law school. And those that can immediately have an impact, because they immediately can use existing private law institutions, now yeah, extending liability, limiting liability, this is something we can already do with existing private law norms, but it's a question of application, and first in front line are lawyers here in South Us or in other, uh, in other law firms. And these are the people that we here in law school, we are educating. We have 1,200 students starting each year in the bachelor. They have inlighting course in, 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 in uh, private law, etc., where we teach technicalities, but where we lack responsibility that three or four years later students must have if they are exercising their powers in law firms and actually help to undermine and go around regulatory choices in order to safeguard higher public goods. So therefore the question comes back, okay, you're probably not familiar with the Dutch, legal, Dutch education system, but it's not that different to the Anglo-American one, um, I, I, have to, I have to admit. So in that sense, what is, has to be changed in legal education we can actually deliver, and from my um, observation of what, you, what, you, what we are describing here, that is actually the most successful route to go, that legal education, private law education, is taking that better on board and makes law students responsible lawyers afterwards. Yeah. So what do we have to change in legal education? What does the 21st century lawyer need as a skill set? Thank you very much for that. So, you know, speaking from my heart, I'm, I'm a law teacher as well, and, and what I write and, and say is mostly addressed at the next generation. I, it's, a hard, it's hard to change the mindset of people in general. I'm hoping that I capture the imagination of, of, of the next generation as I teach in particular. So what has to change, I think um, we have to bring uh, a more multifaceted approach to especially private law institutions. I think we have to wrestle it away from neoliberal law and economics and talk about political economy. There's a movement in the United States and I think it has spilled over, it has another or origin in Europe as well, to understand power structures as well and how institutions evolve in power structures. To give lawyers a sense not of the great technical problems that we face, and they're becoming ever more complicated, but also a greater sense of the systemic effects of what these institutions do to the world. Um, so I think that kind of thinking is critical. Without having that, you can't really change anything. I just want to add a word of caution again, two, th two words of caution. One is the incentive structures in private law firms is a very different one. And once they have that job, they're part of this incentive structure, and I can't blame them for responding to incentives. So I believe in incentives, right? It's very hard to tell a young associate not to recruit new clients. 
um, uh, by offering the service that they want, right? Because you will have to tell them among the different options, there's one that would actually be good for the world and there's another one that will be great for your shareholders. And then you have to mitigate between the two. The second I want to add, and that's the fundamental difference between Europe and the United States, um, students pay over $65,000 per year at Columbia Law School to get an education plus living expenses in, the, in New York, so they leave the law school with $300,000 in debt if they don't have very rich parents. And I think that has to change if you want to tell lawyers to do something else. They have to code capital to pay back their loans. That's a fundamental dilemma that we face. I think our two panelists certainly should have an opinion on what needs to change in education. Doesn't necessarily all only has to be legal education. What needs to change at the the way in which you guys educate the next generation of economists or public administration specialists? Hmm? If you ask me, what what I've been thinking of is. Um, whether economics education at middle schools or secondary schools needs a thorough overhaul, um, and whether actually ecology needs to be taught. Uh, so I, I see a fundamental gain in letting uh, our young people grow up with ecological principles. I think it's very important. And yeah. I think uh, within the realm of economics, there is plenty of scope for improvement. Um, talking about, you know, we have also highlighted a couple of points here. Uh, factors of uh, production, uh, how can you uh, uh, deal with um, um, extractionism and that, that type of thing. I think that, uh, that, that must become part of the curriculum. I think that at the moment it's far too little. Yes, please. And while we get the microphone over there, uh, there's one thing, Marie, I think it was, Marie, it was you asked that, and I found this intriguing, and I'm not sure it has been discussed yet uh, by your fellow panelists. I think you asked, how do we transfer values into the system of the markets, I thought I heard you say at some stage, so like as a question. I was wondering whether, whether, uh, whether uh, Katarina has any thoughts on that, and that, of course, means... Uh, uh, leaving aside liability <laughs> and the liability regime. So let me just understand the question, how we transfer... Values, these values, I mean, I, I heard... Other, this, uh, the, uh, values so other than just monetary oh, values? Or yeah, that was in the context of this oh, book. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because the, these are economists that are just yeah. basic... Values like okay. greening, like the, you know, yeah. the importance of sustainability. Quality, like, yeah, I mean, whatever, I'm, whatever, yeah. It, yeah. Those were you, you're, you brought it in. So, so I think... You know, what we're currently doing is we're trying to translate these values into numbers because only then can we compare them. Yeah. Because most of these goals and values are incompatible with one another and very difficult to compare. We're always comparing apples and oranges. And so the shortcut is to create index, indexes and, and, and taxonomies and they uh, to quantify them and then prioritize some of them. And I think that basically is almost self-defeating because we're not giving the values their... their true value, we're trying to, to monetize them. That's what we do when we apply economic type of thinking. And so, going back to your point earlier, we won't have to give all of them, um, uh, we have to treat them on equal terms, but we also have to respect that these are very different values that are not necessarily commensurate. And that's, I think, one of the dilemmas that we face. And we also have to then respect that some of the tools that we have developed in different disciplines just won't get us there. We need more philosophers, we need more social justice people, we need more ecologists as well. Martin, how do yeah. we get those values into the system? Um, yeah, that's not an easy question, to be honest. <laughs> um, I, I do not believe in the market as a mechanism. I believe in the market as a social construction. Um, um, similar to val to capital uh, and to value, but the way we flesh out value needs to go beyond market value. You know, I, I think Matsukaro has, has uh, convincingly demonstrated that this perspective um, is too limited, uh, even potentially catastrophic, um, and that we need to expand that. And you know, I, I think we're having a, a, a back and forth now about. Uh, what, uh, how value should be represented. I think, indeed, if we have some people measuring value as financial capital and others as 
uh, natural capital then represented in biodiversity, number of areas worldwide, fully nature, with, uh, of humans absent, uh, uh, many more of such, and for human and social capital, similarly for physical capital, such as infrastructures. I think if we get this inter integrally into the decision-making system, both of public and private organizations, then, then we have um, pretty wide coverage of what is of value, um, and then I tend to believe in the system more. Thank you very much. Now we will finally come to the gentleman who has so patiently waited. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for everything. It's very interesting. Um, I'm a Canadian lawyer. I was working in antitrust in Montreal before coming here, and now I'm completing my Master of Economics and Policy Economics. And I, I do agree that there is indeed um, room for improvement in the field of economics, because even here at the master level, there is no class dedicated to climate or environmental economics or ecological economics. So I think we all need to improve. Um, reflecting on the competition law side, um, I agree that we need to expand our approach and um, incorporate uh, climate issues in every field of law. And right now in Canada, there's a big debate on whether we should use antitrust to tackle climate change, either through uh, misleading advertising relations mm -hmm. that will regulate um, greenwashing uh, advertising claims or through regulating sustainability agreements, through cartel regulation. And many practitioners in Canada are saying, no, don't use antitrust to tackle climate change. Antitrust should focus exclusively on antitrust and traditional issues, neoclassical perspectives. And I find it very frustrating that people are not using every tool that is available to them. Um, so th this was just a comment, um, but I, I really like the approach that you're bringing. Um, and I hope that the dinosaurs are, are changing their, their mindset. <laughs> um, my question is, should we focus on individual responsibility or social corporate responsibility? Because you, you talk a lot about liability, and I feel that liability is different than responsibility or moral accountability. Um, for example, uh, most of us have probably uh, been drinking coffee in these plastic cups today. Uh, I'm Canadian, I took the plane to study here. Where should we fix the line between individual responsibility and corporate or social responsibility? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start again. Um, so I think these are very good comments. Um, one of the things I think that we also learn is that we can actually use traditional tools of the law quite effectively if we go back to the original meaning. So as you know, um, in, in the US, we have a new team in antitrust. Uh, my colleague, um, Lina Khan, just became sort of the, um, the, the, the key person at the FTC to enforce antitrust law, and she, her, her name to fame is that she went back to the original meanings of the Sherman Act, which has been bastardized, if you want, to say that uh, antitrust is only to serve consumer interests, which means cheaper prices, rather than market structures. And she has argued against this and is using these tools now to go after big tech, and, and they're doing other things as well. So there's no reason not to use it if it works um, in, in other avenues as well. I think many of the arguments that I made when she was told by economists that she's a voodoo antitrust no. person and doesn't understand markets, and the argument are obvious because it's dangerous what she's doing and they're also asking her to recuse herself from dealing with Amazon because she wrote about Amazon so there's a lot of power games going on there so I think I agree with you we should use all the tools with respect to the legal authorities that were granted to different regulatory agencies there are some boundaries that we also have to respect I think in terms of liability and responsibility I think responsibility is a much larger moral issue, liability is a narrower legal discipline. I think in, a, in an economic system that relies so much on legal tools and institutions and also makes the claim this is all legal, that's my first line of attack. I'm saying, well, if, we, you know, if it's legal, then make it legal, make liability also legal. There's a broader issue of moral responsibility of all actors who participate in that, and I think that's something that we have to encourage. Um, it should also inform the way in which we impose liability, right? It's because there is a moral responsibility of all of us to improve um, um, the environment. I also flew over, um, not only for this talk, I have to say, I try to combine others, but yes, we are all sitting in the same boat. But let's be clear, I think some are 
contributing much, much more to the problems that we have than others. And, and we need coordination, right? We need coordination because our individual contributions alone won't change the system which disincentivizes us <laughs> from doing anything at all. Any comments on this? I, I mean, personally, for, for quite interesting what he said about antitrust law and, and how that should be, some say that should be left to its, its own devices. And I was immediately thinking, well, but doesn't antitrust law not defend a certain value in itself? And what is that value? And why could you not put another value next to that or exchange one value for the other? But I'm, some of you know, I'm not an antitrust law specialist, but I, you know, I, so that's this kind of thinking of uh, how, you know, you, you, you know, as if that is something static, natural law, you, you know, this is the value and it has not been created by, by, by humans uh, as, 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 the, as the value. Uh, y well, certainly there is uh, time for one, one more. If you can bring the uh, microphone, that will be the last uh, uh, question comment. So, Martin, uh, make it worthwhile. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's again about the royalty. Can you, sorry, we didn't hear you, who you are. Introduced. Martin, Martin Verbrug, Erasmus uh, School of Law. I was thinking again about the judiciary. I think that's really where you have to, 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 to put your money. Um, so the, we have to change the laws. We have to be fast. And then that's difficult because to changing the laws, you need politicians. But the judges can actually play a big role, what we've seen, and that's with the open norms. So you have tort law. And especially in the Netherlands, we have seen very powerful cases also in the past where you have the tort cases that suddenly because you have the open norm and you have judges, to courageous judges. So we had the Shell the case you mentioned. In May 2021, there was another Shell case, mm -hmm. very far reaching, and it's actually a judge. So, and also in company law, um, if you want to be courageous as a director, we have seen very great examples like Pullman and Unilever, and then there's a threat of a takeover. You really want to protect yourself. And actually in the Dutch law, it's actually the judges that gave a lot of room to protect yourself even if it's for the environment, so not the highest price, like sometimes in, in the US. So I think the judges, I mean, I have to be sure, but there's really powerful tools with the open norms that you can interpret a, a law differently instead of changing the law, which is very difficult. So we have seen in tort law and examples that are really great, even to the highest court, not always tort, but agenda. Also in company law, I think, and in, the, in the Dutch company law, we have seen great examples. The strategy is on the board in that, on the Dutch law. That's the judges that actually said so. So maybe just to say a few things about Dutch company law and uh, really in inspiring. I think that's really the courageous judges. Yeah. I think it depends on the judges. So there's a reason that the Republicans have packed the courts. Um, or under under the Trump administration, so they you can't rely on them for the agenda that we're talking about, is one response. The the, the other response is that um, you know I think it does does take a lot of time. These individual cases they can shift, right? But we also have precedents that bind you. So in Delaware, we still have Revlon, which basically says, if push comes to shove in the conflict between shareholder value maximization and anything else, shareholder value maximization trumps. And I think one could go beyond that, but you have to create this precedent first. And un unless you do, you know, there's always the debate, can you fix through legislation fast, faster or through case law? It all depends. It, do well, it does depend on the judges that you have in front of you. Well, we are nearing the end of the event, but I would like to uh, uh, finish with one final question to all of you uh, panelists. Um, I'm trying to, to, to end this on a, on a, on a positive, uh, we will make it uh, note uh, with, with, with a request for, for a short answer. So what is maybe your most counterintuitive prediction about how greening could change the economy um, or the legal system, or maybe even the social fabric uh, in the next five to ten years, if you dare to make a prediction. So I'm not going to go first this time. Understandably. <laughs> 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 I have to think. <laughs> Martin, go for it. I, I would say I, I sense among the young generations 
who don't count in te uh, demographic terms, but m in many other terms, I, d I d see a shift. I see a desire for movement uh, against. Now, of course, it's pushed by climate, uh, the media reporting on climate change, about social injustice, growing uh, difference between rich and poor. Um, I think this may uh, end up in a movement putting higher pressure. So if there's anything, I believe in that. Marie. Yeah, I'm hopeful on technology. Uh, we haven't discussed technology. I think there are many uh, people uh, looking for technological uh, innovations. Um, and I think that, uh, well, I'm hoping, uh, but that's my, uh, uh, how did you call it? Counterintuitive uh, prediction, because it's not based on anything uh, real or even realistic, but um, I'm very much hoping that we will find good technologies that can help us. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, you know, some hope that I have is that, um, you know, even on the side of basically corporate managers or so, there is, I think, by now a clear understanding that things have to change. So I think there is, there is more, more hope for multi-stakeholder problem solving under the right conditions. But I think we have to create the right conditions for bringing people around a table and really thinking about how to address the core issues that we have to solve in the next decades. I wished we would do this also in a more um, globalized fashion. We haven't talked about globalization either, which I think um, mm -hmm. has reinforced many of the problematic aspects of capitalism, but I think we have to think about the global south very seriously and make sure that um, this is not going to be just a solution for, for, for the rich, but also for others, which will be harder. But I, I'm, I'm, you know, you, you have to have hope at some level. But there's, I think, uh, a clear need for people to get around a table and find cooperative solutions. And if we don't do that, I don't think we'll make it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pisto, for, for being here today, for, for sharing your, 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 your uh, ideas with us in your keynote. Thank you very much for the uh, two uh, panelists, uh, Peter, uh, Professor Peter Bloom and Professor De Jong, Marie and Martin for, for being here and uh, being such good sports, as they say. And thank you very much to the audience for your questions, also for the online audience for being with us. And with that, I conclude uh, this afternoon and I wish all of us uh, inspiring ideas for the future on how to tackle this wicked problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.